through. Ms. Howington was convicted in docket number 117659 in count one of the lesser included offense of reckless homicide. It's a class D felony. Does everyone agree she is a range one offender? Yes, Your Honor. Because I did follow the sentencing memorandum, which I argue uh, especially mitigated. I understand, but I mean, yes. she's, she doesn't have any range enhancement convictions. Uh, Mike, I didn't get a copy of that. Sentencing memorandum. Um, is there a way that I can get a copy from the court from the court's file? Yeah. I think it was filed you yesterday. Have, I have my copy. I've already read it. All right. So she's two to four, unless the court were to find she's an especially mitigated offender. In counts two and three, she was charged uh, and convicted of aggravated child neglect, a felony. Which count was the uh, serious bodily injury count? Which count was the weapon count? I believe two was the serious bodily injury, three was the weapon. All right, so she's 15 to 25 on each of those unless the court were to find she was an especially mitigated offender. with evidence of C felony, three to six. Count six, tamper, attempted tampering with evidence, D felony, thank you. D felony, two to four. Was there not a false report conviction as well? Yes, count four is false report. D felony two to four. All right, does either side have, other than victim impact, additional testimony that uh, the state or Ms. Hallington wishes for the court to consider before the imposition of judgment in this case? Your Honor, no testimony from the state. I would like to introduce the PSI as Exhibit 1. All right, Mark, the pre-sentence investigation report as Exhibit 1. And then, Your Honor, um, Antoine Oliver has provided me with a few pictures of the victim that he was also at the court to see um, before she died. I mark those collectively as Exhibit 2. Mr. Whalen, any exhibits? No, Your Honor. All right, let me hear the state's position. Let's start first with enhancement factors the state believes are applicable uh, to each of the various counts of conviction. Yes, Your Honor. So the first one that we would ask the court to consider is that the defendant has a history of criminal convictions or criminal behavior. Um, as noted... I'm assuming you're urging that that applies to each of the six counts. Counts two and three merge. Um, which count is... I'm assuming the state is asking <laughs> count two be the one that stands, correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So, um, previous history of criminal convictions or behavior? <coughs> yes, Your Honor. All right. What's the next one? 
that um, the victim of the offense was particularly particularly vulnerable because of age. I think that that probably only applies to count one, um, right. being the reckless the, homicide. What is the doc, What is the statutory subpart number for that? Uh, that is four. Um, and then six, that the personal injuries inflicted upon the victim were particularly great. I believe that that would only apply to count three. Um, that would be the use of the deadly weapon. Okay. Factor eight, that the defendant before trial or sentencing failed to comply with the conditions um, of a sentence involving release into the community. Nine, the defendant possessed or employed a firearm um, or other deadly weapon during the commission of the offense. That would only apply to um, one, two, and five also because that was the tampering that involved the weapon, but especially to one and two, it wouldn't apply to three with the deadly weapon. So which, which tampering count was the weapon? Um, that was count five that she was actually, that was the full tampering and then count six was the attempted tampering of the phone. And then finally, um, factor 10, that the defendant had no hesitation to committing a crime where the risk of human life was high. separate judgments of conviction on each but by operation of law those judgments will merge but they can argue the enhancement factors that they believe are applicable as to each count and was it three that were merging into two was that three will merge into two all right general do you wish to be heard on any of the enhancement factors do you have any argument yes uh, yes your honor i won't I, I did file a sentencing memorandum so i won't go through them as extensively as i did in the sentencing memorandum um, but just as as it relates to that first factor the previous history of criminal convictions or behavior um, the defendant does have a couple of prior misdemeanor convictions it looks like for a failure to appear driving on revoked in a dui um, but really what I, I believe is most applicable here is the criminal behavior uh, we heard during the trial that the defendant was engaged in drug transactions prior to this, um, prior to the shooting of her daughter. She was selling pills to people. Uh, Mr. Key testified about that. He further testified that he actually met the defendant because she was selling pills to another individual that he knew. Um, she, in her own interview, admitted to selling drugs. That was apparently her. Um, that is why she claims she tried to destroy her phone is because there were evidence of drug transactions within her phone. Um, but not only, not only that, Your Honor, I, I, I want the court to, to take notice of, of all of the other things that she did in this case in, in particular that she wasn't charged with, okay? And so specifically, again, if, if we're believing Ms. Howington's story that it was her two-year-old that got the gun and shot the five-year-old, having the gun where the two-year-old could possess it in and of itself is neglectful. Obviously, she wasn't charged with that, but I do believe that it's something that the court can consider. Additionally, um, I think that it's very relevant that in this case, this defendant tried to literally frame um, the, the victim's father for first degree murder. She went as so far as to actually pick him out of a police photo lineup. That's how far she took it. I mean, by my count, she easily could have been charged with probably 10 or more reports of false reporting because she gave a different statement almost every time she opened her mouth. Um, and so we would just ask the court to, to take um, notice of, of not only the, the criminal convictions that she has, but even the criminal behavior in this case alone that she wasn't charged with is very significant. As it relates to uh, factor four, that the victim was particularly vulnerable because of age. Again, I believe that this applies to the homicide count. Um, here, the victim was five years old, obviously. She was very vulnerable. She was very young. I mean, we heard the testimony. She was sitting on her couch watching cartoons when she was shot and killed. Um, she actually had the remote in her hand. The bullet 
passed through her hand, passed through the remote, and went into her chest. And so we would ask the court to apply that particular enhancement factor to that count. Um, the personal injuries inflicted upon the victim were particularly great. Again, um, this would only apply to count three, the use of a deadly weapon. Obviously, we know that they were great. She lost her life. Uh, the defendant before trial or sentencing failed to comply with the conditions of a sentence involving release into the community. Uh, the defendant was on bond for several years in this case. The pre-sentence investigation reports that are part of the court's records um, indicate that she failed multiple drug screens up until, I believe, the middle of 2022. So almost two years that she was on pretrial, she kept failing drug screens for marijuana. In the pre-sentence investigation report, she admits that she kept smoking marijuana until 2022. Um, which would be a violation of a pretrial release. Um, possessed or employed a firearm. Again, um, I know that her story was that the two-year-old possessed the firearm, but at the end of the day, this was her, her gun. She admitted to that. Um, if it is true that she just left it around the house, it's still her responsibility. Also, it applies, I believe, to the tampering count, where it specifically involves her trying to conceal this gun in the bush outside the home after her daughter was shot. Um, and then finally, as to the last one, again, that the defendant had no hesitation about committing a crime or the risk of human life was high. I don't want to so I believe that that would go to um, the, the child neglect in this case. I mean, she had no hesitation whatsoever. She knew she had a gun in her house. She claims that she, she knew that somebody else had apparently put it back in her house. She didn't try and check to see where it was. She didn't try to make sure that it was safe. She didn't attempt to make sure that her children couldn't gain access to it. She did absolutely nothing um, as it relates specifically to the neglect, knowing That's that- not subsumed by the elements of the offense on the neglect. Well, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that it's fully subsumed within them. I, I guess it could be potentially um, in the in the deadly weapon, I'm not sure that, I mean, serious bodily injury doesn't, doesn't mean that somebody's gonna die. So I don't know that it's all the way consumed within the serious bodily injury count. Um, but again, like I said, she, this was her gun. She apparently didn't know where it was for days, but a, a two-year-old finds it in about four minutes. Um, so we would ask the court to apply that factor as well. Do you want me to, are you just focusing on the enhancement factors right for now? I'm just focusing on the enhancement factors. Mr. Whalen, address the enhancement factors as urged by the state, whether you agree with them or object to them. Once you have concluded doing that, uh, address whatever mitigating factors you believe are applicable under TCA 40, 35, 113. Yes, sir. Uh, as to the history of convictions or behavior, uh, there is the most minimum of misdemeanor history in this case. And on top of that, it was this failure to appear in Sullivan County where she was sentenced to do community service and gets raped by the officer who's, main, who's managing the community service program 18 months before this incident, which, as I will argue later, contributed to the uh, PTSD that she was suffering at the time this happened. The, uh, and the abuse of Mr. Oliver, who apparently is not going to be standing here today saying anything either. Um, Your Honor, he is going to give a victim impact statement. He has asked the state to read it, just to let the court know. He has the right in the statute to give a victim impact statement. I understand that. He will not be giving the victim impact statement. He'll have them read it. He didn't testify at trial, though some of what he said was used. So Focus on the enhancement and the mitigating factors. That is one of the, what we'll also be arguing in, as mitigation. Uh, the state wants to talk about uncharged drug uh, transactions. The court might recall Ms. Ho Ms. Howington's interrogation and how many times Riddle told her, we ain't the drug police, we don't care about drug cases, this ain't about drugs, this is about a five-year-old child who's dead. Then we introduce it at trial, now we argue it at sentencing, even though she wasn't charged. So I would suggest that none of that should apply, Judge. Uh, rumors of conduct should not be used for sentencing purposes in a case like this or any other case that there are constitutional guidelines for a reason in the, the plea agreement form, which is produced by the court and in those cubby holes over there, talks about you understand that if you enter this plea, this, these charges could be used if you are convicted of something in the future. Uh, the, 
the idea of, of vulnerability of the, the child, it, that is one of the elements in the child neglect. Uh, so, so I, I think they're only urging that as to count one, the reckless homicide. And I don't know how you, how you use that in, a, in what the jury had an opportunity to convict her of, uh, felony first degree murder. Did not and found reckless homicide. And so a reckless act is not something that should be considered when we talk about the age of the victim. What they said was, they, that the state said, no one's going to tell you that she intended to do this. Well, what the case law says interpreting that particular factor is that there has to be um, the, the vulnerability of the victim has to be in some way causally connected. Uh, in other words, it was easier for the defendant to commit the crime because of the particular vulnerability of the victim, be it age or other some right. form of infirmity. And I would suggest that either under a negligence theory or reckless that she was convicted of, there's no, nothing that would suggest it was this com crime was committed in order to take advantage of the young age of, of the individual. So I don't think that applies, Judge. Uh, and again, injuries inflicted upon the victim were particularly great. Uh, again, she was charged with felony first degree murder, was not convicted <coughs> of that. Uh, and so we're back to the reckless homicide uh, and that's an element of reckless homicide. Right. And so I don't but see. I think I think the argument is that um, the injuries as to count to the um, aggravated child neglect count that uh, the statute requires that they prove serious bodily injury. In this instance, it went beyond that. It was death. Well, and and what we have is a, a case in which count one was homicide a. a, a felony murder in perpetration of aggravated child neglect. So when the jury finds that that was, finds her not guilty of that charge, finds her guilty of reckless homicide and aggravated child neglect, it, it puts you in a different situation because technically that's the uh, definition of felony murder. So we're saying, okay, there was a reckless homicide and the underlying felony of the felony murder. And so I don't know how you separate those now at this point for sentence enhancement. And again, I think more so, not all cases are the same. This is a case where they're saying and said to the jury, we're not telling you she intended any of this to happen. And then again, almost like with the, vic the age of the victim, if she didn't intend any of it to happen, then how do we hold her responsible any more for particularly great injury that she didn't intend to happen than we did for AIDS? This was a horrendous family tragedy, which has not been made any better for anybody uh, because of this trial and, and its conclusion. It's still a tragedy, and it's as much a tragedy for Ms. Howington as it is for anybody else. Unfortunately, Mr. Whalen, most of what this court deals with on a daily basis is tragedies. I, I don't disagree, Judge, but I, what we rarely see them at this at this level. I mean, in this circumstance, I, I don't know how pretrial release got to be a, a sentence of release to the community. I'm, uh, I'm not very concerned about that. But I will. I have to say because the state has brought it out. If you look at the entire report, which which is attached, uh, I believe to their memorandum, uh, shows that she had three. April, May, and June drug, dirty drug screens, which for a regular user of marijuana would not necessarily be unaccounted. Un, un you would almost expect that to be true for 90 days. After that, she, she had been clean every time they tested her. She did everything pretrial asked her to do, made every appointment, kept up with uh, payments, kept up with payments for GPS. I, I would suggest she was very successful uh, in that particular endeavor. So for those reasons, we don't believe that any of the enhancements should agree, should apply in this case. What mitigating the, factors under the statute do you urge? I would, uh, number three, that substantial grounds exist tending to excuse or justify defendant's criminal conduct 
though failing to establish a defense. And again, Ms. Howington, at this point, no one can deny that she was diagnosed and treated for PTSD based on the rape at the hands of a police officer in Sullivan County and the physical abuse and mental abuse and emotional abuse of Mr. Oliver, including three days before this event when he shows up and then wants to talk about how he's the victim of that, but she had to get a gun to say, get off my property. He wouldn't go away. He's upset because she's got her boyfriend there. So there's that. Then we have that she comes home after taking the kids across town to the, their favorite park, comes home in the dark, is at the house, a shot rings out, which as you recall during Fort Iron, we talked to lots of uh, potential jurors who had people with PTSD in their life, who said that that shot going off would be a trigger. Uh, then seeing that it's your daughter has been killed and your son has pulled the trigger. All those things contribute to the mental state she is in when she is then taken to the hospital, not allowed to go with her daughter, but taken to the hospital, told her daughter is dead and within an hour is in the interview room with Mr. Riddle. And when she tells them she's nervous because she was raped by a cop, he loses her mind, his mind and yells and screams at her and questions her humanity. At that point, that interview was over. That, she is fully triggered at this point and by an officer who's sitting there talking to, to the woman whose child is dead and yelling and screaming at her over and over again. And the state then stands up again and says, well, you should consider as an enhancement factor uncharged conduct in that she tried to frame Antoine Oliver. The testimony is crystal clear. I asked them who raised Antoine Oliver as a suspect first. They did. Then you asked her, do you believe he would do that? And she said, no, I guarantee you he didn't do it. And then they stayed on it until she says, I can't take it. You're right. I can't take it anymore. You're right. She did not try to frame Antoine Oliver. They did. And then you have the nerve to come in here and tell the jury different and then stand up at sentencing and say different. That, was not, that is not true. It has never been true. She agreed with them after denying it and telling them she guaranteed them he did not do it. A woman who in her mental condition is in the interview room from about 11 p.m. until 4 a.m. with them. She did not get the 48 to 72 hours a police officer would have gotten to, to be able to get their thoughts together. She went from the hospital being told your daughter's dead to being interviewed. Further, we would say that number seven applies, that she was motivated by a desire to provide necessity for, the, for her, her family or herself. And what she said from the beginning was that she le puts that gun outside and within minutes after all that is texting her friend to go pick up the gun that Gavin killed Destiny. So she's telling that story from the beginning. She explains to them why when she tells them that story that she didn't tell them in the beginning to the, say that to the police was because she didn't want Gavin to live with the fact that he had accidentally killed his sister. There's been no proof that that's not true, that that wasn't her motivation. And she was telling people from, she told Mr. Key from the beginning uh, and Mr. Key again has raised, I should have raised that on the enhancements, that he said he met her as through somebody else who Ms. Howington sold pills to. Your Honor may recall that the Friday before that trial, he testified, he knew her, he was introduced to her to do odd jobs around the house. And he did odd jobs around the house. And he got some pills. And then he comes to trial and so she says, how do you know him? Oh, uh, as a drug dealer. That's not what he testified to at that suppression, at that hearing uh, the Friday before the trial. That, that was not the first thought of Ms. Howington. It was about that she paid him to do odd jobs around the house. Uh, but that part of the story that, that she was trying to protect Gavin was consistent if it wasn't the first statement she gave them because she was still trying to protect Gavin at that point. She gives them the 
uh, statement that an unknown black man fired a shot from the, from the door. Clearly, she did not do that for racial reasons. Both of the parent, the fathers of both of her children, of those young children, are black men. She is not. She didn't have anything against black men. She's just trying to protect Gavin and keep them off of Gavin. Does is that necessarily a rational concern? It might be if you got PTSD and you've just been through what she's been through. Uh, it would make, tend to make you irrational. The third mitigator we would submit is number eight, that she was suffering from a mental or physical condition that significantly reduced her culpability for the offense. <coughs> and that, again, is just the same thing I've argued before, is on the PTSD and what's happened that night in her home, and then being taken to the police department and abused by uh, Detective Riddle uh, in a way I've never seen happen before in any interview uh, or to that level. The the last uh, mitigator is that number 11, although guilty of the crime that she committed the offense under such unusual circumstances that it's unlikely uh, that a sustained intent to violate the law motivated the conduct. There, unfortunately, the, when we look at what the medical examiner said, once that shot was fired, but within 90 seconds at the most, that child, w w Destiny, was dead. Uh, the responding officer said, you know, he tried uh, to save her life. That by the time he got there, Destiny would have been dead. And he finally admitted that, yes, clinically, she was deceased. Uh, clinically and in every other way at that, by that moment. So that it's a horrible thing, but for him, he was, uh, he did the best he could under the circumstances. So we would, at, we would suggest, Judge, that there was, again, because of the way it's charged, even, as a negligent act, it is hard to understand how you could negligently uh, intend to violate the law uh, in, in this matter or that that intent motivated the criminal conduct. It was com this idea that she had a gun in the house and didn't know where it was. Had it not been for Mr. Oliver coming over and being upset that a boyfriend was there and taking the gun away from her, throwing it on the ground, and he testified, Callie picked it up, put it back together. She testified, Callie said, what do I do with this? She said, put it away. When they asked her in the police department, where do you keep your gun? She told them where she kept her gun. She wasn't thinking, she hadn't had that 48 to 72 hours, that she didn't know where Callie put the gun. It was just a horrible circumstance on that particular day that led that gun to be where Gavin could find it. So we would say that if you find, the court finds that there are uh, she has no prior felony convictions, and I think that's clear. And that there are no, if the court finds that there are no enhancement factors and finds that there is a mitigating factor, then we would ask the court to sentence her as a specially mitigated offender. It would reduce the sentence on that charge to 13.5, I think. And the lesser rate means nothing but it's a constricted sentence under the statute that's still 85 percent so that that's what we would be asking the court to do all right the state has in their sentencing memorandum urged that under tca 40 35 115 that uh, consecutive sentencing should be considered by the court as each of you are familiar and well versed in that in this state in order for this court to impose a consecutive sentence unless otherwise provided by law that she has to meet one of the criteria within that statute which do you say are applicable so your honor if you don't if you don't mind just because i did not get a chance to respond to um mr wayland's you don't need to let's go to consecutive sentencing okay um the ones that we specifically say are one that the defendant is a professional criminal who has knowingly devoted um, life to criminal acts as a major source of life livelihood and um, 
four, that the defendant is a dangerous offender whose behavior indicates little or no regard for human life and no hesitation about committing a crime. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I said, I said one. I meant to say two and four. Well, does, Your Honor. I meant to say two and four, um, not one and four. So two being that the defend, defendant who has a, is bleh, the defendant is an offender whose record of criminal activity is extensive, and four being that the defendant is a dangerous offender whose behavior indicates little or no regard for human life and no hesitation about committing a crime when the uh, risk to human life is high. And so, Your Honor, I, I, I do just want to kind of touch on a few things that Mr. Whalen just said. Um, first of all, when we're talking about Miss Howington and all these problems that she is suffering, the only evidence that was introduced regarding her PTSD or anything else like that came straight from her mouth. But we that's did not. True. That's misstating the record. They went through her purse and asked her about every medication she was on, and it was all PTSD cycle psych I'm meds. <clears throat> That flashed to both of you. I tried the case, and I'm very familiar with what the facts are. You don't need to address the enhancement factors. Make your argument on consecutive sentencing. Um, when we look at number two, that the defendant is a offender whose record of criminal activity is extensive, um, there's case law that makes it very clear that that does not necessarily mean a defendant who has multiple prior convictions. The court can look to the criminal conduct in the case at hand when determining whether or not a defendant is someone who has a record uh, or ex an extensive record of criminal activity. Again, Your Honor, when we look at this case, the defense wants to keep arguing this is a tragedy, this is an accident, all, all these things. I, I don't dispute the fact this is 100% a tragedy. The problem is the tragedy was caused by the defendant and no one else. They want to point the blame at, at the child's father who was nowhere near when, when the shooting occurred. They want to point the blame at uh, saying that she was raped, by the way, which, again, I'm not saying that she wasn't. I'm not saying that she's a victim. What I'm saying is that in that particular case, Your Honor, the person who she said raped her was convicted of false reports. That is all we know. And certainly, um, Mr. Whalen would not allow the state to get up here and call somebody who was convicted of false reports a rapist. So that, that's all I'll say about that. Um, she... Again, every single thing that happened in this case was her fault and her fault alone. Not only did she, according to her own statement, leave a loaded and cocked firearm within reach of a two-year-old for days. That was her testimony. Her testimony was that this happened days before, that Callie supposedly went inside, put it, put it away. She never checked where he put it. She never, she never did anything. But then a two-year-old, again, according to her statement, a two-year-old has the ability to find it within about three minutes. He's, he was pretty small. The court saw pictures, measurements of him. He didn't, he didn't take stools around everywhere and climb up like she initially claimed. That was not the case. This thing was sitting out where it was easily accessible to him. This tragedy was 100% preventable. And the person that should have and could have prevented it is the defendant. She's not the victim here. The victim is the five-year-old child that died, okay? So not only do we have the issue of this, this defendant being just careless and, and negligent as far as it goes with the gun, it's her actions after her daughter is shot that, that we urge the court to consider. All right, thank you. Um, and also, well, I guess that kind of goes in with the behavior indicates little or no regard for human life. Um, a lot of that does. There are just a couple of other things that I do want to bring to the court's attention. Sorry. Um, again, I, we talk about the detectives beating up on her and everything like that. Your Honor, I, we all saw the video. The detectives absolutely did say they suggested Antoine first, okay? No, no doubt about that. The fact of the matter is she knew good and well that Antoine had nothing to do with it. She could have persisted in saying no. That's all she had to do. She didn't have to continue to make up story after story after story. She didn't have to pick him out of a lineup. Mr. Oliver could not go to his own daughter's funeral because she had literally framed him for murder. When she took that stand and I asked her that, her words verbatim were, Antoine didn't matter. That's what she said. Those were her words. I didn't put those words in her mouth. The detectives didn't put the words in her mouth. 
Those were her words on the stand. She did not care about him whatsoever. She didn't care. She didn't care about anybody in this case but herself. She, this was not about protecting two-year-old Gavin. All of her lies were not about protecting Gavin. If she wanted to protect her son, she should have done that before he got a hold of her gun. Um, so for all those reasons, Your Honor, in, in this case, we are asking the court to not only give the maximum sentences, but we are asking the court to, to order consecutive sentences based on those factors. All right, let me hear from, uh, is Mr. Oliver going to be the only uh, victim impact statement? Yes. Let me hear that. I do have some argument on consecutive. Uh, folks, the, the, the case law on this is very clear. And, you know, I can do this for show, but I don't operate that way. It would never stand up on appeal in this court's humble judgment to sentence her consecutively. Um, let me hear from Mr. Oliver. So you does have a victim impact statement that I'm going to read. You're going to read it? I'm going to read it. On his okay. <clears throat> Your Honor, I have a lot to say. I beg the court in diligence while I speak my piece because I found over the years I'm not always afforded an opportunity to say stuff and I must speak the truth. So this time, if for no other reason than that, this court is going to hear the truth. I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell you if nobody else says it, I'm going to speak the truth and this is it. Who knew that on September the 12th of 2019, that would be the last time that I got to see and spend time with my beautiful daughter, Destiny Jariah Oliver. She was absolutely the true definition of a daddy's girl. All Destiny ever wanted was to be with her daddy. Robin was jealous of our relationship and she couldn't stand it. Destiny was the best daughter that any father could have asked for. I was so excited to surprise my daughter and to have the opportunity to pick her up from school that Thursday. Her face always lit up when I arrived to get her and that day was no different. I always made plans of doing a lot of fun activities with her after school when I was able to get her. That day was different though. It was very special. First, we went and got food from her favorite place, Chick-fil-A. Next, we continued our journey to National Fitness Center off Walbrook Drive in Knoxville. She went swimming and she also did rock climbing that day. After a few hours, we left there and went to Brewster's to get ice cream. We ordered our ice cream and sat on the bench and enjoyed it together. As we sat there, I looked at my baby girl. I knew something wasn't right, but I couldn't put my finger on it. We talked about what she wanted to be for Halloween and what she wanted for her sixth birthday that was coming up that was less than four weeks away. But that moment was extra special as I stared into my daughter's eyes, not knowing that it would be the last time of having her in my possession. My last time being able to do anything with my precious daughter. We left West Knoxville and headed back over towards Fountain City so that I could take her home. As I got closer to Broadway, Robin called and asked if I could go to Party City to get a costume for Destiny for school. We had a few words. At that point, I knew that she was trying to cause problems. I hung up on her and went to Party City and let Destiny pick out her costume for school. Shortly after that, we arrived at her house. I got Destiny out of my vehicle, and as I approached the door of the house, Robin came out of the house and instantly started attacking me. I tried to deflect the blows that she was throwing. Then her boyfriend came outside, and I asked him to get her, but he refused. He then closed the door so that the kids couldn't see what was going on. Robin and I had a few more words before she went back inside and came back out with a gun. I asked her, what are you going to do with that? And she said she was going to shoot me. I noticed that she really didn't know what she was doing. And the first chance that I got, I grabbed the gun and disarmed her. I took the clip and made sure that no round was in the chamber. I was going to throw the gun on the roof of the house so that she couldn't get to it, but ended up tossing the clip in one direction and the gun in the opposite direction so that they would be far, far apart from each other. Robin then ran back into the house to get something else. I didn't know what she was doing, so I got back in my vehicle. She came back out with her cell phone, threatening to call the police on me. She asked her boyfriend, did he fire, find the firearm, and he said yes. She then proceeded to try to open the door of my vehicle, yelling and screaming at me. I rolled my window down and told her boyfriend that he needed to get away from her because she's trouble and that he had no clue what a psychopath, that she was a psychopath, and then I left. To this very day, I wish that I never had taken Destiny back over there that Thursday night. Robin then called me early Saturday morning as if nothing happened Thursday night. I did get to speak to my daughter on the phone, but it was not long at all. Robin took the phone from her and proceeded to talk as if nothing happened. I told her she was crazy and then I hung up on her. I didn't speak to her anymore that Saturday. I didn't find out about Destiny's death until the next day, which was Sunday, and was told that she had passed away. The grandmother called and told me that Destiny was dead. I couldn't believe what I was being told. It was the worst day of my life. My family and I went straight to the Knoxville Police Department to find out what happened to Destiny. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't being lied to. I spoke with an officer. He asked me a few questions about my whereabouts Saturday night, and shortly after that, he said that I was the one who had killed my daughter, which was false. I wasn't even in the city when my daughter had died. 
I was told to come back the following day to speak with detectives. I came back in the next day, which was Monday, and I was interrogated for quite some time. The detectives wanted my cell phone so that they could search it and invade my privacy. I was humiliated, yelled at by these detectives, and then accused of killing my own daughter in cold blood. I couldn't believe what I was going through. Here I am, a grieving father that had just lost his daughter and being blamed for killing her. I was threatened multiple times that if I didn't give them my cell phone that they would hold me and lock me up. I ended up giving it to them and still haven't received it back to this day. Two days after the interrogation, they got a search warrant and kicked in my door and raided my residence. They told my landlord that I was wanted for murder and that I was never coming back because I was going down for killing destiny. My landlord thought very highly of me until that day and he wanted me out of the house immediately. Unfortunately, I wasn't there at the time of the raid and that was the same time as my daughter's funeral. I wasn't able to attend the funeral because of this situation. They really ruined my entire life while I was still trying to process the death of my baby girl. I was unable to get all of my belongings from the house. Some items were stolen, some items were also left behind. I ended up spending a lot of unnecessary funds on attorney's fees because I was being accused when I was completely innocent and had nothing to do with any, any of it. Your Honor, this woman has caused my family, friends, and I so much pain and heartache. heartache. She has been a very violent individual. In the past, she tried to have my ex-girlfriend kidnapped and admitted that to me. My ex-girlfriend had to purchase a gun for protection because of Robin. Robin has vandalized multiple, multiple vehicles of mine. She has vandalized one of my other friend's vehicles that was parked outside of my place. Ron, let's go beyond the scope. It's, I can consider it only for the purposes of victim impact statement. It's not evidence that will be within the record. I've lost thousands and thousands of dollars that I've invested over the years because of this low life. She has harassed me by following me and popping up at my house at all times and stalked me for years because I didn't want to be with her and she couldn't stand seeing me in a relationship with someone else. She broke into my house and stole a lot of valuable items previously. She has lied and made false reports numerous times. One time she even called the police and told them that I was kidnapping our daughter one night. She had the whole entire police department at my house for nothing. She's threatened to have my mother's brains blown out. She's also said that she knew people that didn't have a problem with killing a kid. She even called DCS on my son's mom for no reason, trying to get her, trying to get her children taken away from her. This woman should have been taken off the streets years ago and put away behind bars, but she lies and manipulates the system and always manages to slip away without getting in trouble. This woman is a real piece of work, as you can all see by now. This is, isn't even a fraction of all that she's put me through. Robin used my daughter to get at me any way that she could. Sometimes she would go weeks without letting me see and talk to Destiny. There were numerous times that Destiny cried and cried because she didn't want to go back home with her mother. As of October of 2017, Miss um, Howington had lost, Robin had lost custody of both Destiny and Gavin. They awarded custody to Robin's mother. I knew nothing about this. No one contacted me about the situation at all. I never knew anything about these court dates. I didn't find this out until March of 2019. I went to pay child support and happened to ask for any and all documentation filed on Destiny because I was seeking custody of my daughter. They printed out numerous documents and this is how all of this was revealed to me. After two years of me not knowing any of this, it was finally revealed because of my actions. I found out that Robin had a real bad drug habit and she'd lost custody of Destiny because she fe kept failing drug screens while she was pregnant with Gavin. The court awarded the grandmother custody without my knowledge. Even when Destiny died, the grandmother was there supervising the kids, was supposed to be there supervising the kids because she was appointed to do so. Robin wasn't allowed to have the children unsupervised. The grandmother violated a court order and failed us all as well as the state because they shouldn't have been awarded custody without each of the fathers being evaluated and looked at as having custody of their own children. The state would have done their job properly, correctly, my daughter would have been in better care and would still be alive today. <laughs> Robin is negligent, she cared nothing about her children, she made up multiple lies uh, years back and had me arrested. I had to enter a best interest plea just to keep from going to jail. I provided video evidence of her actions. She has been the, the aggressor this entire time telling me that she's gonna have me put in prison somehow, some way. Even in this case, she told law enforcement that I was the one that had killed my daughter. I am the victim here and she needs to be put away forever. She lied historically and used the state of Tennessee as a weapon against me and everybody else and attempted to do the same thing in this case. In the past, I've shown videos that I've taken surreptitiously to have to prove that this country isn't premised on proving our innocence. I've had to prove my innocence all because she is a woman, but in reality, she is a low life and cared not nothing about destiny or her other children. The only thing she cares about is herself. She lied repeatedly in this case. She's culpable in it. Robin is the reason that my daughter is dead. It is my desire to see her rot in prison. I want her to be there for the rest of her life if possible. 
If not, I beg the court to give her the maximum sentence possible. She deserves to die in prison. She is responsible for the death of one of the weakest in society, a small innocent child who was defenseless and had no say in what her mother did and put her through. Yet she did it over and over, and the state turned a blind eye to it. She deserves to die in a prison cell somewhere. That's what I'm asking, to put her in prison for as long as you possibly can. She's a liar, she's a manipulator, she's responsible for the death of our daughter. Robin is a poor excuse for a human being. She, she again, is responsible for the death of a child, someone who didn't have any say-so in what was going on. She manipulated the courts in this country and punked everyone here for years making up lies about me. Again, I've had to enter a best, best interest plea and my attorneys have had to show videos that I've taken to prove my innocence. I've had to prove my own innocence and that's not how this country was founded. That's not what our constitution is premised upon. But I've had to do that because she is a master liar and manipulator and used this court and every court in this country to her benefit to get even with me and to accomplish her will all because I didn't want to be with her. Even during the course of this case, she's lied through her teeth and said it was me that was, was responsible for this horrific tragedy. I ask this court to give her the maximum sentence possible. It is my desire to see her spend the rest of her life in a prison cell. Because of Robin, I have no daughter now. At a minimum, I desire for her to be put away forever. I'm asking for consecutive sentences. Maximums on every charge ran consecu consecutively so that she never comes out of prison. She is a poor excuse for a human being. That is what prisons are made for, is to keep people like her who victimize anybody that they can for their own benefit. I'm asking you to keep her in there forever. If you can give her, if you can give her a life sentence, Your Honor, that still wouldn't be enough. It's my desire for, to see her go away for the rest of her life. It's my desire to see her die in prison. She blamed, or I'm sorry, you know what else she did? She blamed it on her two-year-old son for the death of our daughter. She is a despicable human being. Not only did she victimize and cause the death of our daughter, she further victimized her own two-year-old child by blaming him for his sister's death. Your Honor, I am begging you to give her the longest and maximum sentence that you possibly can string together. All right, thank you. Ms. Hallington, this is your opportunity to speak before the court makes certain findings and pronounces judgment. In this case, you're not required to, but this is your opportunity if you wish to. All right. The court is tasked pursuant to TCA 4035-114 and TCA 4035-113 to first find whether um, enhancement and mitigating factors which are confined to these two statutes, statutes are applicable. The state urges a number of different enhancement factors. Um, there's a couple that I'm going to rely upon because I think they're just glaringly obvious in this case. And while I could find perhaps other enhancement factors, I don't think there's any point in muddying the record up on appeal with uh, going into those because there's no specific set of enhancement factors. There's no calculus or graph that the court has to follow as far as I can only go up so far if I find uh, one versus finding five. That's not what the law says. Ms. Howington, this is a strange case. This is one of the more unusual cases among the hundreds that I've tried as a lawyer or as a judge. Um, but there are a couple of things in this case that are just glaringly obvious. I agree with what General Good just said a few minutes ago. You are not the victim in this case. You have a previous history of criminal convictions or criminal behavior. Uh, what you had before the night uh, that this tragedy occurred was not very significant, although you were engaged, engaged in the trafficking of illicit narcotics, and the court can consider that. But I really don't know how you could have um, made this much worse than what you did that night. Within literally minutes uh, of when your daughter had been shot and killed, you were attempting to hide the firearm that was used to kill her. You're not concerned, you weren't then, you're not now. You're not concerned with trying to protect Gavin. You're concerned with trying to protect Gavin's mother. And you have been, you were that night, and I will believe that from this point forward. I don't know how you could interpret this evidence any other way. You have a previous history of criminal conviction, criminal behavior. You tried to hide the gun that was used to kill your daughter uh, while her body was still warm. When you were taken to UT Hospital, 
to be checked for shock before you spoke with law enforcement. You attempted to solicit another, solicit another person uh, to take your cell phone so that it couldn't be looked at, and then you tried to destroy the cell phone. Within seconds, if not minutes, of when your daughter was shot and killed, you're calling 911 and making up a story about how it all happened. And repetitively, I quit counting at about 20, uh, repetitively throughout hours worth of police interviews, not just that night, but on other occasions as well, uh, you made up story after story after story. And this court can consider every bit of that as criminal conduct. So uh, you clearly have a previous history of criminal convictions or criminal behavior, which enhances your sentence in this case. As to count two, the aggravated child neglect where there was serious bodily injury, uh, count enhancement factor number nine applies as well. A firearm and your handling of that firearm is the reason that your daughter is not here now. It's not because Antoine Oliver showed up two days earlier. Um, I simply, it, it strains the bounds of credulity to believe that your boyfriend just laid that gun down where a small toddler could just walk in within two or three minutes after you and your children arrived home, found the gun, pointed it at your daughter, and pulled the trigger when that gun had been in that same place for 24 to 36 hours and nobody saw it. I, I just, I, I will never believe that. And I don't think you were honest with the jury about how that happened. But the simple fact remains that uh, however he found it, you were responsible for that gun. What I believe happened if in fact it was your child that had the gun uh, when the bullet was fired that killed your daughter, there was a man that came in. And I don't know if it really was somebody to collect window tent payments like you testified to, or if it was a, a, a pill deal, but somebody came in. It was a strange man in your house, and I believe you had that gun out for protection. I believe you had a round chambered and the safety off, and that gun was left there, and when you stepped out to smoke, the tragedy occurred, but that's on you and nobody else. So I, th I place great significance on the two enhancement factors that I found, your history as well as uh, the firearm use in this case. Uh, as stated previously, the, the mitigating factors, um, this was an unusual case. There are unusual circumstances, but I don't place much weight on that as far as mitigating your punishment. So if you would, please, ma'am, stand up. Ms. Allington, in docket number 117659, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty in count one of the lesser included offense of reckless homicide, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of three years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. In count two, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of aggravated child neglect, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of 22 years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. In count four, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of false report, a class D felony, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of three years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. In count five, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of tampering with evidence, a class C felony, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of five years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. And finally, in count six, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of attempted tampering with evidence, a class D felony, you were sentenced to a term of three years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. These sentences will be served concurrently one with the other for a total aggregate sentence of 22 years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction. And as your attorney has pointed out, uh, the service rate is at 85%. I wish we weren't here. I know that you wish you weren't here. Mr. Oliver wishes that we weren't here, but you're the one responsible. That'll be the judgment of the court. Good luck to you. When do we need to set this for motion for new trial? We need a transcript. I, I don't I suspect that's going to take. That's it's going to take a while. She's really backed up. I mean, we're. Why don't we set this out about five to six months just for status on see where the transcript is, and then we'll um, set another date, a firm date for motion for new trial.